Good afternoon. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for coming to a gloomy session on the Euro crisis and putting up with a German accent. I want to tell you today that the Euro crisis is not over, that we have to talk about Europe again and that there are still quite a few risks around. And that's the message I would like you to take away from the session. As Nadine just said, a few years ago, of course, we talked about the Euro crisis on a daily basis. We talked about Italy, Greece, Spain, France. We talked about all sorts of rescue packages, the ESM, the EFSF. And really, this kept us quite busy for a while. So all of these economists' covers here are from 2011, 2012. They would probably still um, look familiar to you because this was actually dominating our news for quite some time. But more recently, of course, and I think the Economist is a very good barometer for that, there is a change of mood in the global economy and certainly in Europe. And now we don't talk about that anymore. We talk about uh, Macron, the new French president, walking on water, saving Europe. We talk about cool Germany, which I find personally quite appealing. Um, <laughs> it's quite nice sometimes to be German, not always, but... <laughs> and we're waiting for the football match tomorrow. Um, and actually, if you look at the data, this kind of optimism seems justified. So, um, not just that the Euro crisis has disappeared from our front pages, some data actually also support the view that the Euro crisis is finally over. So the Greek bailout program, this is coming to an end in July. The ECB will stop bond buying at the end of the year, so we're actually seeing a return to more normal monetary policy conditions in Europe. And of course, if you look at growth, <clears throat> the forecast for this year is 2.5% growth in the Eurozone. So just a few years ago, that was close to zero. There was practically no growth happening in Europe, so that's some progress. And unemployment, finally, it peaked in 2013 at 12.1% across the whole of the Eurozone. This is down to about 8.5% today. So actually, things have become a lot better. But does that mean that the Euro crisis is over? I don't think so. Because there is a hidden crisis that you may have never heard about, which is still a trillion euro crisis. And this crisis has a name. It's Target 2. It is a hidden bailout mechanism that was discovered by a prominent German economist called Hans Werner Sinn, the guy with a funny beard. He is Germany's um, most cited economist, the top economist in Germany. You, you probably don't find any better expert on anything economics related in Germany than Hans Werner Sinn. He was president of the IFO Institute in Munich for almost two decades. And around 2011, he heard from a former president of the German Bundesbank, the central bank, there is a strange kind of position on the Bundesbank's balance sheet, and I've got no idea what it is. Can you please help me? So Hans Werner Sinn and a few of his colleagues from the IFO Institute started digging themselves into the Bundesbank balance sheet, trying to figure out what's going on. And what they discovered was a payments mechanism. So it's a very appropriate topic for your conference. The payment mechanism called Target 2, it's an abbreviation that stands for Trans-European Automated Real-Time Growth Settlement Express Transfer System. Let's just call it Target 2. Now, if you wonder what Target 2 is, the European Central Bank defines this like this. Target 2 settles payments related to monetary policy operations, interbank and customer payments, and payments relating to the operations of all large-value net settlement systems and other financial market infrastructures handling the euro, such as security se settlement payments or central counterparties. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Right, OK. It's, it's basically a system that binds together not just Europe's central banks. And let's not forget, it's not just the European Central Bank. There are still national central banks. And it binds them together with all sorts of other financial institutions, such as banks, commercial banks, private banks in the Eurozone's member countries. So it's pretty complicated. If we wanted to boil it down into a simpler definition, we could probably say that Target 2 is just an ordinary clearing mechanism between the Eurosystem's banks. And it was meant to facilitate transfers, financial transfers, from one country to another country, all part of the Eurozone, from one commercial bank to another central bank, uh, commercial bank in another country. And as such, of course, these settlement systems, of course, shouldn't carry any great balances around. In ordinary circumstances, in ordinary times, the balances in Target 2 should be zero and just fluctuate around zero. And in that sense, it's not different from clearance systems in other central banking systems, such as the US Fed. In the US Fed system, of course, there are regional Feds. They also have clearing mechanisms, and they work in a relatively similar way to Target 2 with 
some minor but quite important differences. So my task today is to explain to you how the system works, and it is bloody complicated. Most Europeans have no idea it even exists. Um, most politicians don't know it exists. It exists. It is really difficult to explain in simple terms what's going on. So what I thought I do today is I use a metaphor first to give you a bit of a flavor for the crisis before in into going into the details. And the metaphor is this picture. In case you don't recognize this uh, eight-year-old boy there, that's me. That's my mum. We were on holiday in 1984, somewhere in West Germany, in a holiday home, and we were playing Monopoly. I loved playing Monopoly when I was a child. Um, I think it led me straight on the path of becoming an economist later. Um, and I usually won against my parents. That you can't see my dad in the picture is because I had already bankrupted him and he took the picture. <laughs> but I didn't just like winning. I liked to win big time. And that, that's what typically happened. My parents are still telling me I was terrible as a child playing Monopoly because I really wanted to win, and I wanted to win big time. So what happened was I typically drove my parents into bankruptcy. But that wasn't enough. When they were bankrupt, I gave them credit. <laughs> because I wanted this game to continue, because it was wonderful winning. And so we played and played and played, and I got richer and richer and richer on paper, and they stayed at my hotels, and they paid, and I gave them more credit, and we kept it going for two or three hours until my parents had enough. And then, at the end of it, they were still bankrupt, and I couldn't actually get what I gave them in credit. Now, that's a bit of a lesson. So if you take the Monopoly metaphor and you think, well, actually, that young boy, that's not me, that's Germany, and my mum is the rest of the Eurozone, then you've got a rough idea what's currently happening in Europe. The Germans love playing this game because it feels great. They're winning, they're exporting, everybody buys German stuff, Germany's growing, unemployment is low, it's wonderful. Except they finance it themselves, and they finance it with a Target 2 system. And that's all fine as long as the game keeps going. But once the game stops, the Germans will realize actually it wasn't really worth that much because the others still can't pay us back. So that's what's happening with the Target 2 system. And now I'm going to talk you through the technicalities of it, but just keep that metaphor in mind because once you've understood that, you know what Target 2 is about. Now, just some stylized facts about the Eurozone and about intra-European trade. This is a little bit com more complicated than Monopoly, but let's just go through it quickly. Before the euro was introduced, of course, there was also intra-European trade, but of course there were competing currencies, the currencies could actually be revalued if necessary, and that's what happened quite regularly. So when you had comp differences in competitiveness, when one country was better than the others and when one country got more productive than the others, typically what happened is you would see this reflected in a change of the exchange rate. And therefore, because the exchange rate was able to reflect these competitiveness differences, you couldn't build up enormous trade surpluses. These tra trade surpluses would kind of go down automatically with an appreciation in the exchange rate. After the introduction of the euro, 99, you could no longer do that because you had transformed Europe into a system of effectively fixed exchange rates. So if you no longer can change the exchange rate, you need to find some other valve for persistent productivity differences because there were productivity differences still. Just because you put one currency on top of Europe doesn't mean that the competitiveness differences disappear. They are still there. They just need a different way of showing up. So what you found then was you found that suddenly persistent trade surpluses and trade deficits opened up across Europe. And this is where Target 2 comes in. Now, explained roughly what was happening with the introduction of the euro. I just want to show you just in practical terms what it meant. If you look at exchange rates to the German mark, in the 35 years before the euro was introduced, what you can see is that Germany, being quite a productive, quite a competitive economy, was able to um, basically see its currency appreciate against the rest of Europe, even against the rest of the world. I put the UK and the US there too, just so you can see where the picture was going. So, one example, 1963, when my parents first went to Italy on holiday, they had to pay six marks and 41 pfennigs for a thousand lira. Before the euro was introduced, 1998, and we holidayed in Italy often, it was just about a mark that you had to pay for a thousand lira. So for German, 
tourists, this was a wonderful thing, of course, because your holiday got cheaper and cheaper year after year. And that's how Germans got rewarded for their productivity. So the Germans got better and better. They could afford longer holidays and better holidays. But crucially, the other Europeans could still go on with their economies and they wouldn't actually record any great trade deficits or surpluses because that was reflected in changes of the exchange rate. Also, what you can see in the next slide is, because of this valve of exchange rate adjustments, you didn't really have persistent trade surpluses. But once you introduced the euro, of course, German trade, trade, uh, sur German trade surplus really took off. So look at um, the trade surplus for Germany until roughly 1999, and yes, it was kind of positive, but really, after the introduction of the euro, it took off. And it took off because the new exchange rate of the euro was just not appropriate for Germany. They were just way more competitive, and that's why they kept exporting like crazy. The flip side of that is, of course, France or other European countries, because their exports were crippled by the euro. They could no longer devalue, as they did in all these decades before. They didn't change their ways. In fact, they actually became less competitive anyway, because they also enjoyed the low interest rates that they now got through the euro membership, and therefore they lost even more competitiveness and were driven into a trade deficit. Now, Another way of looking at it is um, looking at um, labor unit costs. So here you really see the competitiveness differences across Europe. So Germany entered the euro with an exchange rate that was quite unfavorable at the time for Germany. So Germany actually had to keep wages low for the first few years of the euro membership. They also reformed their economy. They had the hearts reforms, they reformed the labor market. It was really tough in Germany at the time. I was there. But Germany reformed for the first time in I don't know how many decades. They properly reformed. And that's how they kept their competitiveness high in the first decade of the euro. The other European countries, particularly in the European periphery, well, they celebrated the party. Because it was wonderful. If you were in Greece before, in Italy, and you're used to really high interest rates, because that's what was required, suddenly the euro comes in, you get cheap money, you get cheap interest rates, you actually enjoy life, and you really celebrate a great party. But what happened then is, of course, that's the prelude of the euro crisis that really struck in around 10, 2010, 2011, until markets realized, actually, you can't really keep this up. It's not healthy and markets became a little bit suspicious about um, the uh, stability of their banking system, the stability of government debt. Now, what happened then is, of course, Target 2, at that point, when the markets realized that something wasn't quite right, stepped in. So I just want to show you one slide here, which shows you the German Bundesbank, so the central bank's balance sheet on the asset side. Um, so first look at one position there. That's the Target 2 balance. So that's what other central banks, the European um, central banking system, actually owes Germany. And you can see, this was the clearing mechanism that I described earlier, target two. It was round about zero until 2007, and then something happened, and suddenly it took off, and it currently stands at 956 billion euros. That was uh, the current number for the 31st of May. And you can also see um, quite a few movements in the euro crisis nicely reflected in that curve. So what you can see is that, of course, it took off around 2007 with the global financial crisis, so about three years before we started talking about Greece. It calmed down a little bit after 2012. That was when Mario Draghi, the um, ECB president, said that his institution would do whatever it takes to keep the euro alive kind of calmed down, but more recently it's gone up again, and certainly with the election of a new Italian government, um, that has accelerated again, and I think it's quite likely that this month we're going to see a trillion euros on the Bundesbank's balance sheet under target two. Now, just want to show you the balance sheet in comparison. So take the last year before the crisis, take 2006, and have a look at the Bundesbank's balance sheet. So, as I said, this is the asset side of the Bundesbank. Total assets, 373 billion euros, compared to 1.7 trillion euros today. So, in 11 years, the Bundesbank has massively inflated its balance sheet. Now, that in itself wouldn't be so unusual, because many other central banks have done the same. I mean, look at the Bank of England, look at the Bank of Japan, look at the Fed. They have all really blown up their balance sheets in response to the financial crisis. And this is basically the position that you see there, securities of euro area residents denominated in euro, 512 billion euros. That's the kind of stuff that all central banks have done. 
What's different about the Bundesbank and other e uh, euro system central banks is this intra euro systems claims position. So uh, that was practically zero in 2006. And um, supposition under intra euro system claims is other claims against the euro system. This is the kind of claim that Hans Werner Sinn stumbled across um, in 2011 when Helmut Schlesinger asked him, what, what does that actually mean, other claims against the euro system? What kind of claims could we have? Now, this was, as I said, 18 billion euros in 2006. It has gone up by the end of last year to 919 billion euros. So if you just have a look at the balance sheet, you can see this is now about eight times the German gold reserves. It's a position that stands on the balance sheet. It's more than half the German Bundesbank's balance sheet. And actually, it's a claim that is a bit strange because there's no one you can really claim it from. There is a claim against the euro system. Well, the euro system doesn't really exist. I mean, the ECB exists, and the Bank of Greece exists, and the Banca d'Italia exists. But um, the euro system is a bit nebulous. Crucially, this position also doesn't bear any interest. So you've got a position on the Bundesbank's balance sheet that doesn't yield any interests and that you can't claim back. Now, I'm not sure whether I misunderstand something here, but typically when you've got a position that you can't claim back and doesn't yield any interest, you write it off, right? Well, except you can't really write 900 billion euros off because it would wreck the Bundesbank and you would actually ask taxpayers to bail it out. So this system is going on across the Eurozone, and these are all the different central banks. Um, Germany's Bundesbank is the biggest creditor under Target 2. And then there are quite a few debtors in the system, mainly um, Spain and Italy, also Greece a little bit still. And now, really, the question is, why did it take off in 2007? I mean, they had this Target 2 system before. Why suddenly in 2007 does Target 2 become a financing mechanism for the rest of Europe? I want to give you one very simple example and explain what happens. It's just an example. There are other ways of Target 2 working, but we'll get to that. So let's just imagine we have a Greek farmer and we have a German manufacturer of tractors. Now the Greek farmer wants a new tractor. So under normal circumstances, what would happen? The Greek farmer would go to his commercial bank and say, I need a loan. I need a new tractor. And the Greek, Greek commercial bank would probably finance this and refinance itself in international markets. And in this way, the Greek farmer could then buy that tractor. The money could be channeled through the Target 2 system. It would end up in Germany. The German um, manufacturer would get paid. What happened in 2007 is, of course, if we remember, markets became very skeptical about the um, health of the Euro system's um, uh, periphery. So there was suddenly no trust anymore in the Greek banking system for good reason. And so the Greek commercial bank should have then said to the Greek farmer, that's very nice, you want a tractor, but unfortunately we can't refinance, we can't do anything about that. So you, unfortunately you can't import your tractor anymore, we can't just make that work financially. Had that happened, of course, it would have been a major disaster for Greece because Greece ran a massive trade deficit and basically Greek trade would have come to a halt and the country would have been thrown into a massive crisis. And to pre prevent that, Target 2 intervened and bailed out the Greek commercial banks. So this is how it works. The Greek central bank intervenes and says, OK, commercial bank, if you can't find the money in international markets anymore, but we still want to keep the system going, we'll just create some money for you. So central bank money is created at the Greek central bank level. That money is, of course, credited to the Greek commercial bank, and they then basically pay it out electronically to the Greek farmer. The Greek farmer pays it back to the Greek commercial bank so he can pay for his tractor. And the Greek commercial bank hands it back to the Greek central bank. So what we have here is a process where central bank, bank money is created and destroyed immediately in Greece. That money never leaves Greece. What happens instead is target two, the magic of target two. Because under target two, the German Bundesbank now creates that money. It is not channeled to the Bundesbank. The Bundesbank is instructed, you have to create this new central bank money. We had just created it, destroyed it in Greece, it's coming back to you. You create it, you pay it out to the manufacturer's commercial bank, and they pay it, off, uh, to, pay it out to the manufacturer of the tractor. So the manufacturer gets paid, and that's wonderful. And that's why the Germans are really happy, because they export like crazy. They still get paid. They only get paid, of course, because um, money is created artificially. 
What happens now for the Bundesbank is this. The Bundesbank gets a claim against the euro system. They don't get a claim against the Greek central bank or the Greek commercial bank or the Greek farmer. They get a claim against the anonymous euro system. And similarly, um, there is a Greek target to liability vis-a-vis -vis the euro system. So this is what we had seen earlier. Now, when the Bundesbank or any central bank creates money to pay it out to someone, typically what they do get is a claim against a specific institution. If the Bundesbank creates money, normally they get a claim against, say, Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank. In this case, they don't get a claim against any specific bank, they get a claim against the euro system. And so the problem is that over time, you build these positions, you build these claims, and um, the system keeps going. And it's very convenient. It's convenient politically as well. It's basically a golden credit card. It's a constant overdraft facility. It's wonderful because you can just keep this export boom going. I mean, if I were the German chancellor, I would say, wonderful, this is great. Unemployment's going down, export's looking fantastic. Um, everything's fantastic and happy. And I don't have to ask my parliament whether that's okay, because every other bailout mechanism has to go through the Bundestag. This one was never even debated in parliament, but it's worth four times the ESM. It's great. The problem is, of course, this is not really sustainable, because Germany keeps creating money out of thin air on behalf of others, but doesn't get any kind of claims in return. And so what I would argue here is that we are seeing a system where maybe it was justified around 2007, 8, if you wanted to prevent the collapse of some southern European economies. But it has now institutionalized and maintained these balance of payments deficits uh, and imbalances. Um, it has also um, basically maintained the, uh, the trade deficits that we see across Europe. What it has meant is, of course, that um, the creditor nations, mainly Germany, have built up these enormous claims, and I believe we are going to see a trillion euro um, next month in target two claims against the rest of Europe. Um, and what we can also see is, of course, that Germany's export surpluses, the stuff that Germany is really proud of, was basically financed by its own central bank for nothing in return but dubious claims. Sounds great? So, the, um, I think I'm a bit lost. I think um, if we go through the next slide, you can see that there are the first newspapers now waking up to that crisis. So Handelsblatt, which is um, kind of a German version of the NBR, um, had a headline just a few weeks ago where they asked, um, when is a trillion euro not a trillion euro? Well, uh, when it's called target two, because it's a trillion euro that kind of stands on the Bundesbank's balance sheet and isn't really worth much at all. And um, if you look into the Daily Telegraph in London last week on Thursday, they had an article about the new Italian government and the new Italian parliament. You know that um, in Italy, two Eurosceptical parties have taken over the power, and um, they quoted in the Daily Telegraph the new head of um, the lower house's budget committee, um, Claudio Borghi, who is um, Lega, so the populist uh, northern party, um, Lega's economic spokesperson. And Look at what he says. It's, this quote is wonderful. He says, um, a former trader at Deutsche Bank said the best solution for everybody is for Germany to leave the Eurozone. Yep, probably, because um, actually they should have never formed the Euro, but that's a different matter. If Germany refuses to leave the Eurozone, he says, then Italy can just pass a law converting its debt obligations into florins or lira overnight. So basically worthless paper that nobody wants. Great, and the losses would shift to the national central banks through the target two system. It's great. So here we've got an Italian who really understands how the system works. The Germans have no idea. <laughs> so he says, we owe the others 440 billion, which we can never pay back because we're bankrupt anyway. So how do we get rid of that stuff on Banca d'Italia's balance sheet? Well, simply we just say Lex Monete, we can pay back our debt in any currency we choose. So we just introduce a new lira, worthless, and say, okay, we, we pay target two in this new currency, and you can just write it all off. Now, um, every central bank in the euro system would have to take the hit. If Italy defaults on 440 billion euros of target two liabilities, every other central bank has to take a hit according to their share of the ECB's subscribed capital. In the case of Germany, that would be 28%. So Italy leaving, saying 440 billion, goodbye, arrivederci. Germany takes more than 100 billion euros as a hit and you have to write that off. And because if you write it off, the Bundesbank is bankrupt, you would have German taxpayers bailing out their central bank. So, in summary, 
I think we actually need to talk about Europe again. I'm really sorry about that. We thought the crisis was over, and I've just demonstrated to you the crisis has just been swept under the carpet. It's still there. It's just hidden in the bank's balance sheets. So there are these risks. There is the risk that Target 2 may just explode, um, that it could cause the next GFC, that it could probably cause um, severe problems in Europe's banking system because all commercial banks are, of course, uh, connected with um, central banks. So if the Bundesbank has a problem, then Deutsche Bank, which is fragile enough, and Commerzbank and all the other banks in Germany will certainly have a problem. So what would happen then? Anyone's guess. The Germans could, of course, then decide to finally leave the euro, introduce a new currency, and somehow with some financial magic recapitalize their central banks, or they could just ask um, their taxpayers to bail out the central bank. In any case, I think what the Germans would then realize is that for all these years, while they thought they were just exporting like crazy and everything's fine and the economy's humming and unemployment is low, that wasn't really worth anything because the Germans were just playing Monopoly. They kept the game going when the others were bankrupt. And to keep the game going, they paid the bankrupts, uh, bankrupt countries extra loans. So they did exactly what I did with my poor mum in 1984 and kept a Monopoly game going and didn't gain anything in return. Final thing, um, if you think it's just trade, that's, of course, not quite correct. It has a lot to do with capital flight as well. You don't even have to move anything across the Eurozone. You don't have to move tractors or um, German cars or machinery. It is just enough, actually, for the rest of Europe to become jittery about their own um, financial system stability. Just take that money, transfer it to Germany, safe haven, capital flight, and the Target 2 system actually works in exactly the same way. So this is why the Target 2 balance is currently going up, because the Italians are getting a bit jittery about their own money because of the new Italian government, and that's why they're shifting billions of euros from Italy to Germany. But for every billion shifted out of the fragile Italian banking system, the Banca d'Italia jumps in, creates more money, and the Bundesbank has to create a Target 2 claim against the rest of the Euro system. So it's trade imbalances, it is capital flight, it's a complete madness, it's organized madness, that's the Euro. And with that, I leave you. <laughs> with